Welcome everybody to the panel Mastering New Energy Economics. If you're using social media, the hashtag is WEF23. And without further ado, I'm going to begin. We're in a crisis, perhaps the worst crisis in a generation. Not since the 1970s have we experienced an energy emergency on this kind of scale. One, and once again, that is hitting the most vulnerable the hardest. What we actually have is interwoven crises. West calling it polycrisis, post-pandemic inflation, food insecurity, the climate crisis, and of course, the illegal war in Ukraine. Tackling one requires addressing them all. Energy literally fuels the global economy, providing it in a cost-effective, efficient, equitable, and crucially sustainable manner is a fundamental necessity. Today's short-term decisions must accelerate us towards a secure energy future tomorrow. It requires, as you're here today, a massive, massive rise in renewable energy investment, and it has to reach the most vulnerable nations that need it most and simply cannot afford it. The good news, and there is good news, not too serious right now, renewable in energy investment did jump in the past year, up 12% from a paltry 2% post the Paris agreements. And also major economies stepped up to provide tangible support. The less good news, we'll call it bad news. Fossil fuel subsidies doubled in 2021 and have probably continued to rise. The industry itself says, look, even if we meet our Paris obligations, oil and gas will still provide for around half of our energy needs in 2040. If that's the case, then that reality requires thoughtful infrastructure investment today. What's more, the lack of diversification that exists in energy supply today exists in clean energy too. Great example, electric car batteries rose 10% in the past year. Cobalt, lithium, nickel, all those prices rose. Like OPEC Plus today, the nations that mine these inputs hold serious playing cards in the future. Energy supply chains have to be strong, diverse, sustainable, or we're simply in danger of swapping one challenge today for another, and that's going to require global cooperation. Finally, our role as consumers, the new energy economy requires significant change from us. The total energy bill paid in the past year, $10 trillion globally for the first time ever. What's more, the top 10% of households consume 20 times the energy of the lowest 10%. The richest nations of the world have proved that they can drop their demand when prices are high. That has to continue as prices come down because it's simply the right thing to do. Whether we like it or not, this is the reality of the new energy economy. Now it's down to us to master the policies that will sustain both the planet and its people. Now, enough of me. Let's talk about this with some of the world's most energetic masters, even at this time in the morning. May I introduce my panel, Fatih Birol, Executive Director of the IEA, Joseph Sikla, who's the Minister of Industry and Trade for the Czech Republic, Vicky Holler, President and CEO of Occidental, Patty Poppy, CEO of PG&E, and Martin Wolf, Associate Editor and Chief Economics Commentator at the Financial Times. Welcome, everybody. Fatih, I'm going to kick off with you. You've said it. Clean energy, energy security, inextricably linked. There's opportunities, there's also huge risks. Just spell it out for us briefly. So many thanks, Judy, and also framing the discussion in the beginning. Uh, Tried. Uh, 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 well done. So, uh, 24th of February was the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, and 1st of March, just a week later, we set the entire world very publicly that we are entering the first global energy crisis. Our world has never ever seen an energy crisis of this depth and of this complexity. Why? This is very simple, the reason. Because Russia, as of 24th of February, was the number one energy exporter of the world. We aren't talking about any country top energy exporter, number one oil exporter of the world, number one gas exporter of the world, major player in the uh, uh, coal markets. And 
the Russia's uh, 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 actions and the measures that the countries took against Russia uh, meant we are in the middle of the first global energy crisis with huge implications on oil and gas uh, markets. Uh, we are seeing it in Europe, in the rest of the world. However, this crisis, while we are going through this crisis, at the same time, it gave a big boost to clean energy development. Mm. Because in the, in the past, uh, the uh, uh, clean energy was renewables, electric cars, efficiency heat pumps. They were growing, but the main driver was environmental reasons. And now, the biggest growth, biggest driver of renewable uh, energy growth uh, today is energy security. Renewables are uh, pushed very strongly because mainly for energy security reasons, because it's homegrown. <coughs> Renewables are the, the energy of peace. So uh, therefore, uh, the long lasting solutions to our energy security problems go through clean energy. It is renewables, it is solar, wind, efficiency, electric cars, nuclear power, all of them. And uh, uh, when we look at the numbers, uh, Julia, you know that uh, my job is making my hands dirty with data every single day. And I can tell you that the growth we are seeing in the clean energy is very, very strong. Just give you one example, renewable energy, 2022, last year, the growth is compared to one year ago, 25%. We have never seen that. Electric cars, 2019, only three cars out of 100 were sold was electric. And last year, it is 13%, big growth. And if the this trend continues, not even acceleration, in 2030, which is tomorrow, every second car sold in Europe, US, and China, three largest car markets will be electric car. So let's keep this thing in, in, in mind. And maybe finally, let me mention that in addition to this immediate response to energy crisis, there is also more structural response coming from the countries, such as from the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act. In my view, the most important climate action after Paris 2015 agreement. Mm -hmm. So the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act from the United States, Fit for 55 uh, uh, from uh, Europe, uh, Japan, Green Transformation of Japan, uh, the, uh, the incentives, huge incentives in India for the batteries, or China uh, uh, pushing in their five-year plan, big new clean energy technology manufacturing. This is a second uh, uh, dimension in addition to the current immediate responses in terms of renewable efficiency, uh, the heat pumps, electric cars. We are seeing a big push, mainly driven by industrial policies of the uh, countries. I think they will emerge and we will uh, hopefully will have a, a secure and uh, clean energy future. Fatih, I'm going to stop you. And you've stopped anyway, so that's good. You're half, glass half full, which is good. So he's the optimist voice. Martin, I'm going to come to you now for, for the counterbalance. Because we are seeing a rise in investment, which is great, but it's nowhere near enough. And I think Fatih would agree with that, at least today. We need to see a massive rise in investment. And, you know, as he mentioned, if I look at China, if I look at India, if I look at the EU, and we'll hear from the example there, I mean, they have to invest more in, in wind and solar, because as far as I know, no one's worked out how to turn wind off and no one's worked out how to turn the sun off, at least, which I think is an important point. So, um, it's a great story, um, but of course, uh, we're hopelessly behind. Mm. Uh, so, let me just set out how I see it. The good news is um, we all agree that massively expanding the supply of re renewable energy is a climate and security priority, as the point has been made. And the second piece of good news is that these technologies are increasingly cost competitive. Right. And therefore, in economics jargon, they're dominant technologies. That is the, the most economically efficient things we can do. And that means that over time, if a lot of problems are solved, market forces alone will deliver this. But those forces are, of course, because of the scale of what has to be done which is not just money, 
but planning, solving systems, reliability problems, solving the developing country, finance problems. Finance is a huge issue. Um, the market forces just won't get there at, in the time needed. All the serious climate scientists tell us that we have to have very sizable reductions in world emissions by 2030 if we're going to have any chance of keeping close to 1.5 degrees, and that's just not on the horizon. It's not what's been happening. So let's not be complacent about it. We need a massive acceleration of the transformation from where we have been, and that will require dramatic changes in policy, serious incentives, serious de-risking of investment across the world, um, and not just in our own countries. We are not going to solve this problem. Europe generates 10% of emissions in the world. If you include the UK, that's just not relevant to the total picture. So what I want to say is we've got to a more comfortable position technologically and economically than most thought 20 years ago, but we haven't got the world into a more comfortable position and we should not pretend we are. We'll talk about getting over some of the inertia, because as you said, the pricing actually for in many cases is right, but we're still not seeing the kind of investment and the direction of investment that we need. We'll come back to that. You've given me loads of launch points for every uh, other panelist that I want to hear from, but um, Minister Seeker, I'm gonna come to you because I think Europe's been uh, one of those hardest hit and had to make the quickest transitions and taken a significant amount of action in the last year. Talk to me about energy security from your perspective, briefly if you can, as a kicking off point. So, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this very privileged panel. Uh, the second point that I completely agree with uh, Fatih that basically uh, on 24th of February, uh, uh, world, the energy world has changed and this change is irrevocable. Um, I, I give you the simple example of the Czech Republic uh, and then I will come back to, to European issues. Uh, on, uh, with the beginning of the war, Czech Republic as a landlocked country was the, the dependence on the Russian fossil fuel supplies was ultimate. 100% the nuclear fuel, the nuclear bars for the nuclear power plants, 99% gas and more than 50% crude oil. Without infrastructure, the infrastructure was built from the east uh, to the west. So what you do if if you want to impose sanctions or on the aggressor. So, and uh, there are similarities with the Yom Kippur War from 70s, but the combination Europe has to solve and is solving successfully is uh, much worse because it was something like the George Clooney's perfect storm. Not only the market manipulation, which Russia started already before the war, where basically Gazprom rented uh, the storages, the gas storages across Europe, and you know they were with the beginning of the heating season on the record low level, empty, simply empty, without the possibility to get the this 155. We are talking about a replacement of 155 <coughs> billion cubic meters of the natural gas from Russia, so one third of the con consumption of Europe. Then the extreme dry during the summer. So the, the hydropower plants in South Europe were not working, also Scandinavia, and then uh, basically uh, missing capacities in France, uh, 30 reactors out of nuclear reactors, out of uh, 59, out of order because, because the main, of, of the maintenance. So it was like uh, more than 140 uh, ter uh, terawatt capacity, which is the production of the Czech Republic and Slovakia together, the yearly production. So it was uh, the perfect storm, and in combination with the need to uh, fulfill the storages before the winter, uh, extreme pressure on the prices. Uh, 1,000 euro per uh, megawatt hour uh, on the end of the summer for for electricity and, uh, and uh, 350 uh, for gas. So nobody can afford this. There was a, like a big threat uh, that, that the social agreement in European countries will be broken, that there will be a social unrest, uh, that the, the, the industry will not be able basically to pay the electricity bills and uh, the big threat of the deindustrialization. 
What, what is positive is that Europe has again shown the unity under the extreme pressure, and I had the privilege to chair the European uh, Energy Council of the, of the 27 member, member states, and we were able to, to keep the unity and the solidarity and in extremely short time to introduce a package of the measures which basically helped us to calm down uh, uh, the prices, to balance the demand and the supply. Uh, the situation now, if you look on the gas prices, the spot was yesterday on 55. So 350 on the end of the summer, 55 yesterday. Uh, so this is like a heaven and hell. Uh, yeah, okay, the heaven is not as cheap as it was before, but uh, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is affordable. What is extremely important is that the part of the package is the idea of joint purchases in order to prevent for the future these price spikes. What is extremely important that everybody understood that the dependency on the Russian fossil fuels might be reduced by speeding up the renewable resources. So, so basically the, the, the time we missed uh, in the past is not available anymore and we have to act now and we have to act fast. So basically that the euro was able to agree uh, to speed up the, the permitting for the renewable resources and to create funds for this uh, higher speed uh, in, in basically renewables. Uh, of course, what is extremely difficult by taking this extraordinary crisis measures, not to forget the long-term narrative. Right. I want to hear from somebody else. We'll come back to it, because yeah. we'll go into more depth. But this is a yes or no question. Can the momentum that you've achieved over the last 12 months be sustained? Because it has to be. Can it be? So, yes, yes. Is your answer. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that. Um, hmm, now I have a choice. Patty, you also understand crisis in California, the provision of trying to provide 16 million people with stable, we touched on that there, cost effective with prices soaring. And of course, you're fighting the longer term challenges of security against wildfires, the flooding that's going on at this moment. Talk to me about how you view energy security and what you think whether it's for your company or, or more broadly, needs to happen and change and fast? Well, first, uh, thank you for having uh, me. I'm proud to represent the people of California and the people of PG&E. Um, you know, we are in a different kind of war in California, and that is the front line of the war on climate. We're experiencing right. it. We've just had historic uh, flooding. We've had uh, historic wildfires. We've had historic now snowfall, um, an earthquake. Uh, just in the last month, uh, all of those things <laughs> in the last six months. Um, so we're experiencing it. And, and we have some of the most ambitious climate objectives because of that. And the people of California are very resolved. And I'll remind people that the state of California, if it were a country, is either the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world. And Yet, we have very ambitious climate objectives, and I am extremely optimistic about the opportunity to lead this climate transition in a systems mindset way. So as a system, uh, when we optimize that system as we transition, we can do this in the, for the lowest societal cost. And I see a very clear and, and specific pathway to the lowest societal cost of the transition by optimizing uh, distributed resources along with central station, uh, traditional sources of supply, but optimized in a very specific way. So let me just tell, in September we had a, a peak summer uh, heat event. California had its peak demand for electricity on September 6th. And so we are boots on the ground. I was standing watching the load curve creep up and creep up. We saw the battery storage kick in right when it was supposed to. That's new additions to California's energy supply. It worked just like it was supposed to. But as we got very close to having to uh, shut down our uh, transmission systems and, uh, and prevent energy delivery to preserve the grid, the state took a very aggressive action to send out an emergency text message to all of the California cell phones, and instantaneously, 2,500 megawatts came off the system. 
we watched the load curve drop with a straight line, which told me and reaffirmed a, a hypothesis that I have that demand management with modern technology can be automated. We shouldn't have to send a text message. <laughs> it worked. But it you basically said, guys, switch off your air con. Yeah, Stop it, boiling it, it a kettle. It was an emergency no message tea. that said, yes, please reduce your usage. Right. And Californians responded because they're good citizens. But what it says is that could be automated with smart devices, Wi-Fi communicating devices, and electric vehicles. Uh, as a power resource, bi-directional power resource back to the grid would be an, even an additional asset that was what I would refer to as anyways economics. People have already purchased the electric vehicle. It's an investment anyways, get its full value by putting its power back to the grid. And all of that can be automated. Technology can enable that. This is a technology that has never been available in all of our years of delivering energy and electricity in particular to the people of the world. We can now manage demand and have the right use at the right time, not just conserve, not just use less, but instead smooth out the demand curve and have distributed variable resources it can deliver. It will happen, and I'm very optimistic about that. Yeah, and you also have an electric vehicle advantage as well, and I know you're pioneering yes. feeding energy back into the grid at these moments of peak demand. We'll come back to that as well. And uh, Mr. Siegler, I know, is nodding because he wants to talk about how Europe managed to bring their demand down as well. But we'll, we'll, we'll I talk can't about wait it. to hear, I and need all hear the from tricks. Vicky. From Vicky first. It was 15 to 20 percent, though, wasn't it? I can see you smiling. Um, come in here, please, because I think the key word for Martin was emissions. And I think the oil and gas sector has a terrible reputation. I think you would admit that there are pieces of this sector that are recognizing that an existential crisis for the planet is also an existential crisis for them and that's creating inertia, but you have a different way of looking at this. It's sort of a reality check, I think, for all of us. Please explain. Yeah, I, I think that it's what's important to understand is that the enemy is our emissions. It's not the energy source. And what we really need is a more thoughtful transition. And the transition has to be one that's built around ensuring that as we transition, that we don't leave developing countries behind mm -hmm. and emerging uh, countries. Uh, we have to understand that uh, oil is the highest intensity energy at the lowest cost. What we have to do now is we have to address the emissions. And uh, we have uh, been making important strides toward lowering our methane emissions across the industry. And it's been a uh, concerted effort by a lot of companies and countries to make that happen. Um, and I agree with Fatih and Martin uh, that and, and uh, Patty that renewables are critically important. And the reality is that's a part of our transition too. Uh, we need energy to provide um, the, our equipment to run, and we're starting to, to move to using um, renewable energy. Uh, battery um, advancement is important to make that sustainable and to make that uh, a consistent provision of, um, of energy, but that's going to happen, and we're, uh, we're actually, as uh, I will say just Occidental as an example, we, we know that we not only need to lower emissions from our oil and gas operations, we need to lower the emissions from a lot of ind industries. The oil and gas industry is always the industry that's attacked, but the reality is that a lot of the products you use, and you don't like to hear this, but a lot of the products <laughs> you use comes from oil and gas. And so simply building wind and solar is not nearly all of the answer to the question and to the challenge. So we believe that what we're doing will help transition uh, our industry uh, and that is to get very uh, aggressive with, with carbon capture, not just at point source emissions, but you're seeing what's happening around the world with respect to climate change, where we are today. So if we cannot reduce the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere, we have a real problem. So direct air capture, no matter what model you look at, has to be a part of the solution. And we're, we just started construction last quarter of what will be the largest direct air capture facility in the world. It'll extract 500,000 tons of CO2 per year from the atmosphere. The next largest is extracting only 4,000 tons. So this has to happen, and it has to happen in a big way, along with point source uh, capture. And to me, 
if we can all work together to make that happen, that's the best way to, to partner them with solar, wind, and build uh, building electric vehicles. So that is going to be the, the best way to transition. Very quickly, are you in favour of ending subsidies to the oil and gas sector? Because it goes back to uh, the point that, that I think Martin was making about the, the price signals being off at certain times. You know, the, there's no doubt that there's been hardly any game-changing and transformational technology that's ever been developed in the world that, that did not at some point have some sort of subsidy. Like wind and solar, uh, it took about 10 years to reduce the cost of wind and solar by 80%. It's collapsed. Yeah. And, and wind and solar had subsidies. Now we, uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed, and thanks to Senator Manchin, uh, wherever he is, he's here at the conference somewhere. Thank him when you see him. Uh, but the IRA is a, an important bill for us in that it does provide subsidies, not just for carbon capture, but for electric vehicles, for lithium, for, for many other things uh, that will help the climate transition. It's, as Fatty said, it's, and others have said in, in the meeting I just was in, it's one of the most transformational um, passages of um, of a bill ever in the world. And it's, it's, it's going to, I think, jumpstart a lot of things. And, and for us, the, the thing that it does is it does enable us to advance the technology faster. Our goal is to build, was to build 100 of these direct air capture facilities so that we could be, extract 100 million tons of CO2 from the atmosphere between now and 2035. With the passage of that bill, that's going to make it possible for us to build up to 135 of these. So, um, so it is important, and subsidies are are very important for the development of new technologies. And what I'm really excited about, I know there's a lot of, thankfully, a lot of enthusiasm and <laughs> optimism on this panel already. And what I'm really excited about is we're we have an advantage over wind and solar in that we're starting to develop a brand new technology that's critically important for the world. But we're going to be able to build a digital twin as we're building the, the facility so that we can, with that digital twin, advance the, uh, the development and the optimization of that plant a lot faster than wind and solar was able to do. I think that's so, the key. Really, we have to accelerate yeah. everything, whether it's the investment, whether it's the technology, we have to take risks. Sometimes the R&D is not going to work. And I know it's tough during a cost of living crisis where you're having to make short term and longer term decisions. But I think that points to it. Martin, come in here, because there's two things I want to talk about. I want to talk about the best ways to de-risk finance, whether that's to countries that need it most, that can't afford adaption finance, never mind mitigation finance. But I think the other thing, we've touched on it here with the subsidies in the United States, and that is um, creating good competition, not creating protectionism. And I mentioned the dangers of an OPEC plus kind of scenario with some of the minerals like um, and metals like lithium, like cobalt, like nickel. How concerned are you, one, about insecure new supply chains, but also pushing it so far with subsidies that perhaps we create unhealthy competition, and maybe that's a first-class problem. Martin, how do we overcome these things or get the balance right? And we haven't even mentioned China yet. Well, my general view in having watched governments for about half a century and watched climate <laughs> policy for about 25 years is that it's always going to be a mess. Um, <laughs> and Mr. So Stickler, get ready to talk. I'm, I don't look for <laughs> optimality. Uh, or anything vaguely <laughs> like it. Um, it's going to be wasteful, politicised, but it has to move in the right direction. Um, I don't think we're going to, you know, when I think, look at the mess of the nature of our subsidies, what we subsidise, I'm very happy with the subsidise, subsidies in most of the subsidies in the I, uh, IRA. God knows why it's called an Inflation Reduction Act, but never no, you mind. you know why. It's never for mind. Reasons. Never yes, mind. Yes, Please. of course I do. But that's the point I'm making. It's going to be. It's going to be political. It's going to be political. But so what one has to do in practice is find a way to marry political realities uh, with moving us very, very rapidly in the right direction. How? And I, and I would say so far we haven't done a great job at that. But we haven't done an unbelievably bad one either. So the, <laughs> the, um, the answer to that, I think, is countries which have a lot of fiscal room, like the US and yeah. Europe, just need to be prepared to borrow and spend a lot. And, uh, and I'm less worried about fiscal deficits than some, so that's what they're going to have to do. 
the but um, there will be a lot of economic interests pushing them in the right direction because there's a lot of money to be made. So that that has made it more even than it was 20 years ago, but it was basically, if I may say so, the fossil fuels industry pushing against it. Now we actually have a renewables energy industry with everything around it, and everybody can see there's money. So this is good, and that will push people, for governments further to support them. And that's, I think, part of what happened with the, I the IRA and also with Next Gen EU. But the big hole to me the biggest hole is the risk profile in developing and emerging right. countries. And there's some very good reports recently out on this, the high-level group with Nick Stern and uh, Vera Songwe, for example. So these, there are two elements. Uh, uh, the, the, first of all, the problem is that nobody wants to lend money to developing and emerging countries with very few exceptions because they think they might not uh, on cheap terms because they think they might not get their money back. So they raise interest rates to a level at which they guarantee not to get their money back. Now, this is a real trap. And the only way around that is to de-risk it by the developed countries using the international financial institutions right. as risk guarantors. And for that to happen, the major IFIs, and here it's the World Bank more than the IFI, have to be prepared to lose quite a lot of money. And that then gets to really big political issues. Who, who bears ultimately the risks in this system, which has been operating for 60, 70 years on the assumption that essentially they never lose money? Mm -hmm. So this is a, there is a risk. There are risks here that have to be borne by someone. And my view is basically it's the rich country governments because there aren't any other risk bearers. Um, there are lots of other things you can do, equity financing to some extent, but on the scale that is needed and the speed that is needed, we really have to think about how risk is reallocated and borne in the system. If you want this to be a global activity, and remember, emerging and developing countries are where all the growth in energy consumption and emissions are going to come from. Yeah, the World Bank in your case, in particular, needs to take that first loss piece. They have to be willing to bear the greater proportion of the risk. But to do that, they have to manage the scale of the losses from their point of view because they don't want to go back to their shareholders and asking for more capital. Um, but somebody has to take that bite, you know, and say, well, actually, this is so important, we're going to have to risk losing money. Yeah, the mindset has to change. That has to be clear to the shareholders from the beginning. We're going to throw money that at this is, and we're going to throw money uh, that, away. That Good luck with that. The, yeah. Well, that's where you get to the point where what is politically feasible may not actually match with what is globally essential. And when you're in that situation, well, political feasibility has to change. Betty, I'm going to come to you on this because I think this, it's vital to get your insights on this too. But, um, uh, Minister Seekler, I feel, I feel like I've um, sort of teased your responses to a number of these things now. Um, what do you make of this? And how, how, would we, how, do we do, how do we do this? How do we facilitate well, this? I'm going back to the, to the savings. 40% uh, of the energy com com consumption is related to buildings, and uh, the biggest part of, of it uh, is uh, heating. Uh, and, uh, what was extremely important that the Europe was able already during the summer think about the next heating season. And uh, the first extraordinary meeting, and I became known that I convened uh, the historical highest number of extraordinary energy councils in the history of European Union in order simply to align. I said we will sit as long, we will finish basically what we have to finish. And, uh, the first mission in impossible was the alignment on gas savings already during the summer. Save gas for a safe winter was the slogan. Mm. And what was extremely important to convince the population that they are the part of the game. And uh, what is fantastic, for example, in my country, that we were able, with uh, simple measures, to save 15% of the gas consumption only during few months by simply convincing the people they have to heat less, they have to sink uh, if they increase basically uh, the, the room temperature of if they wear a hoodie. And uh, I, I know that we cannot repeat it for a second time, but you know... Why not? 
this is technically not, uh, not possible. Ah, but the you, demand you, response. The, the, the limitation I mean... of this, like uh, hot fixes, is simply given. You you, you cannot afford the people to have a, like a, a, a less than 18 degrees, you know, in the room. So so they are like a technical limitations. So we now now have to come with more advanced uh, approach. Uh, but what is important is that basically Europe is aware and Europe is working in this direction. When it comes to subsidies, uh, as a former banker and um, also partially macroeconomist, uh, I say that you know we, we should be careful because subsidy is something like a doping in the sport. Uh, if you then have to live without the subsidies, it is difficult to turn back to a, to a normal life. And sometimes we see that the people, the entrepreneurs are not thinking what is good for the people, but where I can get subsidies. So I will invest there where I will get uh, biggest subsidies. And uh, I understand the importance of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, from the US perspective. On the other side, in Europe, it is seen much more controversial <laughs> because uh, it is saying to the European investors, go, go to US because this is this is more profitable for you because they will subsidize and they will give you much cheaper energy than you can get in Europe. And when we start a rally of subsidies, this is extremely dangerous because you are speaking about a fiscal room and uh, I, I don't know that, you know, for example, Fed would agree that the fiscal room uh, in the US is as big uh, as some of the people believe. And Europe, it, it, it is not a one animal. We have a uh, we have a situation, countries with 25% inflation, countries with 7% uh, inflation, with completely different levels of indebtedness uh, uh, to a GDP, so with a completely different fiscal room within a Europe. So uh, we have to be smart and we should not allow that the Western world will now also compete where basically the necessary investments will go to. This is capitalism, isn't it? I think this is capitalism. Healthy competition. They're trying to boost their industry. Europe has to, uh, in some way, step up to the plate too. I agree that we don't want siloed investment in the duplication of you investment. Know, subsidies and, research... and capitalism... Uh, yeah, I feel like we have to uh, think outside the box where <laughs> renewable energy is concerned. But I take your point. Vicky, come in here. Martin, I know you want to say I just something. Wanna, I'm quite conscious of time as well. There's plenty of time. I do, I just, do just want to say that mm. subsidies shouldn't last forever. But subsidies really are needed to develop new technologies. What right. we're seeing is we're seeing a growing uh, voluntary compliance market that's willing to pay the price for to, to achieve uh, net neutrality from the standpoint of uh, their carbon footprint. More than 2,000 corporations around the world have committed to that. Right. So we're, we're seeing that subsidies will not be there forever. We don't expect it. We expect to advance our technology so that it will stand alone, support itself, and be a growing business for us. We do expect to become a carbon management company over time. So it is going to be a profitable business. I will say, though, with respect to Europe, I hate to say it, but I have to say it. Imposing windfall profits tax on the oil companies that are doing their best to grow wind and solar in Europe was not the smartest move, okay. in my view. Oh, Fatih, come in here. Because, well, it, I mean, it could have been so, tax-free no, if it were going into renewables. Let me, let me just put this <laughs> investment thing, make it simple for all of us to put it in a frame. Now, if, a big if, if we all want to reach a 1.5 degree target, to keep our climate uh, safe, what the scientists tell us uh, to do our climate target. Today, the world invests one dollar for fossil fuels and one and a half dollars for clean energy. So the ratio is one dollar for uh, fossil fuels, one and a half dollar for clean energy. If we want to reach our uh, target, this ratio of 1 to 1.5 should be 1 to 9. nine. So big increase in clean energy investment and, which makes it even more difficult, the growth of the clean energy investment need to come from the developing countries where cost of capital for clean energy technologies is about six, seven times higher than US 
or Europe and elsewhere. I think this is the nerve center of all the problem. Mm. How, because I believe money and the clean energy projects in Europe and in US, IRA, Fit for 55, at the end, they will meet. But what are we going to do in the emerging countries? And I believe advanced economies have two reasons to support uh, the uh, clean energy financing in developing countries. Number one, one ton of CO2 going to atmosphere from Detroit or from Jakarta or from New York or from Marseille has the same effect on everybody. Yeah. You can do whatever you want at home. It doesn't change if the emissions come from as elsewhere. You can bring the UK emissions, Europe emissions to zero. You will not be able to uh, ha protect yourself from climate change impacts if Indonesia and other countries go along. So first, on a logical reason. And second, the other driver why they should invest help the clean energy transition in developing countries is a moral reason. The, the climate change is an issue of concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, and the, about 80% of this, uh, uh, the carbon in the atmosphere put, in the, uh, uh, put there by the advanced economies since 100 years. So they have a moral reason to clean it up as well. For two reasons, I believe, would it be World Bank reform, the IFIs, and so on? They have to advance uh, this. One thing I have to congratulate uh, Joseph here. He did an excellent job for Europe. If we are still here, enjoying the warm, uh, 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 at least here, the, the, the temperature and the lesser on. Well done, uh, Joseph. The, uh, the temperature, the, the winter, warm winter helped you a bit. We, uh, we should be honest. Uh, but uh, uh, well done, I just wanted to congratulate you. But he still did a good job. Exactly. <laughs> Martin, come in here. And Patty, no, Patty, come in. Okay, thank you. And Martin, I'm coming to you. I just want to um, make a, a point about, Martin, what you said about it won't be optimized. I appreciate that. Uh, but I also think that uh, there's a tradition and the historical investment in technology and even in California, the early investment in wind resources when they weren't popular and weren't economically viable have then made it possible for wind to be developed around the world as well. And so over time, I, I agree wholeheartedly that there's the, the wealthier nations can start the engines of progress and of uh, innovation. And Vicki, I think what you said, I'm so excited about your work and what you're doing with carbon capture, that will create the possibility for developing nations to access that technology in time. And as you said, uh, there's where we fix it, it has a positive impact uh, in, in whatever sequence we do it. So let's go ahead and let the innovation occur. And, and I just think there's such an opportunity to adapt, enable, and accelerate. So we're adapting with hardening our infrastructure, whether we're undergrounding our power lines or building a more uh, resilient distributed energy system that is more secure for people to have power when and where they want it. But we're also enabling in the, in the IRA and the earlier legislation that was passed, it's enabled the extension of nuclear power plants. I have a 2200 uh, megawatt nuclear power plant that was scheduled to close, but because of that legislation and the, the support from the US government and the state of California, we're extending the life of that nuclear power plant. That's, a, that's an uh, enabling investment on the part of uh, the federal government in the United States that has benefits globally. But then finally, to accelerate the advancement of electric transportation as a key resource back to the grid, as well as distributed microgrids. And it's an all of the above. All of us have to do all of it as fast as we can. And I think some of these economic subsidies are absolutely enabling that to happen in the larger, wealthier nations so that the developing nations will then be able to access that technology affordably. Yes, it's not just about providing financing, it's also about the provision of technology yes. as well and yes. subsidizing it and pushing it forward. I'm a naughty girl because I was supposed to open it up to Q&A and we've got one minute left. Martin, the floor is yours. You were waving at me to say something, so <laughs> make it really good, my friend. <laughs> so, no pressure. So, <laughs> I think the situation is incredibly clear in the sense that we sort of know where we've got to go and we have to accelerate the speed at yeah. which we're going there multiple times. Nine times uh, at least. Uh, Nine times. Uh, this will c require a staggering volume of resources, a lot of very, very clever policy, 
and it has to be seen as a global public action program. Uh, the first genuinely, as it were, global effort by humanity to manage the world on a war basis. Right. That's where we are. And in this situation, China. to me, China. the most important thing is that everybody who's involved, p politicians, business owners, have the sense of urgency. Because so much of this is talking about things as if we had years or decades to sort all these out. We don't. And so the, the key is to get the urgency. And in my view is, of course, they're going to spend money. A lot of it is going to be wasteful. A lot of the policies that we'll get through will be intensely irritating. But as long as they're pushing really, really rapidly in the main right, right directions, we'll get there with a lot of luck. And the key things are to look at what isn't happening. Now, what isn't happening is we're not investing nearly enough. Right. Uh, and two, we're not investing nearly enough above all in the places where we know that's not happening because they don't have the money. Right. And it's no good for us to say we don't have any money because we are the only people who do have any in this situation and we've got to do something. That's how it is. Yeah, and citizens. <laughs> citizens have to take responsibility and also we have to buy some room for our politicians to make tough choices for us in the short term that benefit us in the longer term. So I think we all have to, we all have to um, stand up, step up and, and protect our planet and our people. Fatih, you wanted to talk about China. Can you do it in... No, I'm being given the time out. I'm done. Otherwise, I'm going to be fired and I've got to do another panel. Don't Guys, forget China. Exactly. Big player. <laughs> big player. Yeah, we have and, to do it together. Uh, We're one planet. But we have, to be, we have to understand China is the number one driver of clean energy today with yes. all it is pros and cons. Absolutely right. Yeah. And we've got to cooperate with them, obviously. <laughs> oh, Martin, we want to end on an optimistic note. <laughs> 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 to your panel, guys, thank you.